Hello, Aaron Smith. Hi, Jason Thomas. Excellent shirt choice today. You look fantastic. Ah, yes. And welcome to the PWBA podcast. We both got the memo. We did. This is the uh, this is the first time this has happened. Naturally happened. So uh, I'm excited. It's navy blue shirt day for us. Which Are you on the right side of the screen today? I, uh, I'm on the correct side of the okay. screen. Okay. Too, that, yes. That, that, correct side. Yeah, right is confusing. <clears throat> my good, good side. It's good. It's good. We're all comfortable. We're twins. Aaron's on the correct side of the screen. And uh, we have Ashley Galante on the show today. It sounds like all is right with the world there, JT. All is, is right with the world. So <laughs> It is. Should we just get right to it? Bring her on? I like the sound of that. So uh, for episode 34, Ashley Galante, welcome to the PWBA podcast. Thank you guys for having me. <laughs> yeah, I think your dog thinks he's on too. <laughs> he, he's jealous that he's not on like dead center of the camera. <laughs> That's what we like though. So Ashley, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, how have things been for you the past uh, couple months? How you been staying busy? Uh, just what's been new uh, with you? Uh, the last couple of months have been really interesting. I mean, obviously with uh, COVID and everything, uh, I've had a lot more time for myself at home. Uh, I've spent uh, just a lot of time thinking about things that I need to get better at. Uh, I've been reading mental game books. I've been practicing my steps. I've been finding different ways to practice at home, uh, along with working out as best as I can. Um, unfortunately, for like these past three months, um, I've been really getting really bad vertigo. So I haven't been able to work. My workout routine is not nearly as good as it used to be just because it's really hard to work out with all this going on. And even now, it's still not even the best. So vertigo, how, do, do you know what might be uh, the cause of it or, or when did it start? And because I know, you know, there, there have been some pretty big name athletes who have, you know, suffered from from vertigo and, and uh you know, really struggled with it for a while, and it was very difficult for them to diagnose what was causing it. Uh, you know, I've had vertigo since I was 16, and uh, the first time I got it was really, really bad. Like, I couldn't even leave the bed for, like, three days. And then, like, randomly, sometimes I'd get it throughout the years. I really think it's directly related to my allergies, like my sinuses. Um, with us being locked up in the house, you know, you're around the animals a lot more, and then the pollen has been like crazy lately that uh, I think that it's just been kind of building up on me. I have been mean, the medications aren't really working for me right now that I even have to go get a test done, actually like a test that goes in your ear and kind of sees what's going on. Um, there's also a chance I might go for surgery for my nose because I have a deviated septum. And between that and my allergies, like pushing down, like I can't breathe through my nose at all. It's really sad because I actually discovered that I could talk while pinching my nose <laughs> and, my, <laughs> and my voice doesn't change at all. Oh, wow. I, did, I, hmm. I didn't know it was that bad. <laughs> Let me see. Does, is my voice different now? Does it sound the same or different? It's a little, a little bit different. different. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's or, your turn you know, now. Well, you could either pinch your nose or you could get rid of your dog. What was your choices? Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> he, he didn't like, he didn't like that idea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so getting rid of the dogs is it really an option? Yeah, it's not that different. Yeah, oh. that's interesting. That's a that's a talent I did not know that you have. <laughs> I, I just discovered it myself too. <laughs> well, um, I hope that vertigo gets okay. I know it's typically like an inner ear thing. Like there's yeah yeah. So it does sound like you're onto something there with the with the allergies. It has to do with the crystals in your inner ear get loose. And when you move too quickly or whatever, it makes them float around. And while they're in movement is when the whole room starts spinning. And when they go back to settling down, then everything is kind of back to normal. Hmm. So it, I've had it really bad where I couldn't even walk. Like I couldn't get to the couch. I couldn't get to the bedroom. I actually end up getting really like nauseous. Wow. I'm not going to go into, I'm not going to go into any more detail other than I slept yeah. with a bucket all night. Wow. Um, it was it was horrible. And even right now, when I lay down, get up, get down or toss or turn, it's still acting up. So doing when I do my workouts, I have to do very steady work movements. I can't do anything jumping. I can't do anything with quick rotations yet. So 
Wow. Well, it's, it looks, by following your social media accounts, it does look like you have been getting out and bowling some tournaments and, and uh, you know, doing some things. So what, what have you been up to, um, you know, with respect to that? Uh, I've been just trying to stay on top of my game. Since we're not bowling on the women's tour this season, I didn't want to – I didn't want to go – What's the word? I didn't want to get worse because I'm not competing. So I've yeah. been trying to find as many tournaments to bowl during the weekends. Um, I'm bowling between one to two tournaments a weekend. And uh, it, the first one was pretty rough. I'm not going to lie, just getting back out there. And um, everyone since then has been getting better and better. Uh, there are still tournaments where you just, you're just going to have those bad days. But I feel like I'm constantly learning and I'm getting myself a little bit sharper being competitive. Uh, it's nice being in those situations where you need to strike to advance or just when you're talking crap with your friend or whatever. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just being able to feel like I'm stepping up when I need to strike. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. And it looks like uh, one of the tournaments you won there locally was, uh, I believe, the Princess Queens. And uh, I'm going to borrow the photo <laughs> with the with the tiara, uh, and it looks like uh, you knocked off Lucy Sandlin to win that title, a Hall of Famer. Uh, what was it like, uh, you know, just collecting a win in the early going here, and of course, uh, you know, beating a player uh, Lucy's caliber has definitely got to be uh, uh, something pretty cool as well. You know, Lucy is someone that I've looked up to since I was a child. Like I think twelve years old was when my coach first showed me a picture of her and. I always remember my first year at Team USA was like her last year when she was retiring and she's just an outstanding bowler. And, you know, it doesn't matter how, what your age is. She is a fantastic bowler. She still pulls these tricks out of her bags that you're like, that's awesome. Like in the middle of one of our events, she couldn't get the ball to roll properly. So she went to a, a one-step drill and just crushed it. Like completely. It wasn't like, Oh, it's okay. Like, she shot like 190 when before she wasn't like she was shooting probably like 170s or something, and she just got like four strikes in a row to save that game, and it was it was awesome to see. And the fact that she's just willing to just keep, cheap try to keep up with everybody instead of just saying, okay, I'm I had my time, you know. Um, she's an outstanding player, and she's a great friend, and just an awesome role model as well. <laughs> Roy, that is a an appropriate. <laughs> Yeah, tag, but, uh, well, nobody apparently, right? <laughs> it's, it's, uh, yeah. And uh, what I really liked about that tournament, we, the way that the tournament uh, is ran, they have like where you could bowl what the first block, and if you don't like how you did, you could re-enter. So I always bowl the first block because you just really never know. Mm -hmm. And I bowled horrible, not horrible as in I threw it bad. Like I threw the ball great, but I just couldn't get the pin action. Like it was pocket seven ten split. It was. Uh, 10 pin, 8 pin, 9 pin. I left the back row multiple times. No matter what trick I tried pulling out of my bag, no matter what ball, what line, whatever I did, it just wasn't working. So when we ended up having our break before the next block started, I went and I changed some surfaces. I took my prism solid. I put 360 on it, went to the pro shop, had him put um, compound polish on top of it, and then went back and averaged 232 for right. it. So it was kind of cool just to see, like, to even be able to to make that decision uh, with the bowling ball and be able to be successful with it. And that was a trick I actually learned on tour. So, yeah, it's pretty amazing how you know just one little tweak like that, you know, can can take you from you know averaging two zero to two thirty. Um, you know, and it's a pretty common occurrence, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you know when you're bowling well, when you're keeping your feet underneath you, you're executing shots, you're hitting your target. You shouldn't have to always be pinpoint perfect to strike, especially if the field around you is striking. Now, if it was like the U.S. Open, I'm hitting the pocket, leaving 10 pins, I'm just happy I'm hitting the, temp, the, the pocket at that point in time. I, it's okay if I leave the 10 pins. <laughs> yeah, 10 pins are easy to make versus big yeah. like, course. <laughs> yeah. Now, I know there was a, a pretty big event this weekend in Florida. I believe uh, Some Strings Attached was the name of it. I think it was two events over two days. Uh, yes. we, we know you competed in that, and I knew that had the uh, some of the 
string pins, uh, which are definitely a little bit different. Uh, what was it like? Uh, you know, that was definitely a stacked field for sure. But uh, what's yeah. it like competing on uh, the, the string pins? How is it different? Any crazy hits? We saw a few from uh, it looks like Bowler's Journal was covering it pretty intently. Uh, saw some pretty wacky stuff. So uh, what yeah. was it like for you? It was a lot of fun. Um, it was an experience that I'm really happy that I got to have. Uh, I will say that it wasn't what I was expecting. Going into the event, I was thinking you're going to have to be, you know, a little bit more accurate. You have to throw better shots just because I thought the carry was going to be a little bit worse because it had the strings. Um, but actually, the pin movement was pretty good. Hmm. For me, the only two things that I really could say that I felt was really different was that occasionally you'll get that that temp pin that tripped out because a string wrapped around it, um, which still didn't happen that often. It was just once in a while when it did happen. And for spare shooting, you would see a lot more splits being picked up, um, even some harder multiple spins spares that you would if you just threw the shot and you completely missed it there was so much bounce and like the pin would wrap around like the temp pin but the string was still catching and could fall down so you'd get a little bit it would get a little bit more with that but overall i mean for them trying to come out with this new concept it was really cool really surprised about the pin action though really surprised that they were actually able to get the balls to the pins to fall like almost like temp pin bowling nice now um I did. I did do some uh, social media. What is this? The term when you like stalk somebody on social media? What is it called? I think it's just called stalking. Stalking. It's yeah. just. It, it's just <laughs> remain stalking. So. So you know, we're to full disclosure. Ashley and I are friends. We've known each other for a long time since uh, she she worked for Extra Frame and I worked on Extra Frame. But I'm not on social media that much. And uh, you didn't tell me this, but according to social media, you got engaged last month. Is that true? Where did that happen? You did, you did it? I did. Well, not not officially engaged yet, but I, where did that come from? I was like, a, I saw it on your page. It was like a social media post. You had like a little heart. You did like one of those little heart thingies. And somebody said, congratulations on getting engaged. Is that is that real oh. or is that fake? Okay. That fake news. I, it, it's partially fake, partially true. I'll explain why. Okay. Now we're interested. Now you're interested. <laughs> I, I will say COVID has completely screwed up all of those plans because, um, you know, me and my boyfriend have been together for eight years. We're going to be going on nine in March. So he was waiting until after he got out of college to for us to start planning on getting married. I mean, the plan was always to get married. It's just when, you know, having the money, right timing. Um, so after he graduated, he's like, just, I got a job. I start within like two weeks. Um, once I have some money, I'm going to buy you a ring. And he's like, I really would like to buy you a nice ring. So I would like to be able to save up some money for it. Uh, for all he knows, I take a ring pop ring at this point in time. <laughs> but, but I'll take, I'll take a nice ring. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what? So what we happened won't, was is that. We this podcast, so. We can <laughs> oh no! I'll show. I tell everybody. It's okay. <laughs> I I call him out all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so we, with the COVID hitting, um, he was actually he got a job as an RN in emergency department, and with COVID hitting, uh, it actually they postponed it for four months. So he was supposed to start in August, and. Uh, so now not only are we not working, he just lost the job that, well, he has to wait now another four months before he can start really working on his dream job. So that kind of got postponed. And then about two or three weeks ago, they decided to close that program down altogether. Oh, wow. So yeah, now he had to go and look for a different job, which really sucked because he was super happy they offered him a nice salary. He had night shift, which is what he wanted. And he got to work in an emergency department coming straight out of school. So it was like this dream job for him. So I feel really bad that that got messed up. Fortunately, he just started today at his new job, which was exciting. So now he's officially ran out of excuses. Give me a ring. <laughs> 
but well, prior to, but prior to this, I had said I know that we are waiting for you to get a job for the ring. Is it okay if I move forward and start working on the wedding plans? And he said, of course. So I already have a date in mind. I already have some things that I'm like my I'm working on my list. I'm working on where I want to hold the event, where what church I want to go to. So I have been working on actually putting the wedding together. Nice. Very so nice. sort of congratulations. Sort of. <laughs> just, just, just no ring yet. <laughs> not, not the right one. Uh, yeah. Nice. Well, it's good to know that your bowling career is the one's holding it up. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Now he was waiting for me to make the money, and that, that just wasn't happening. <laughs> <laughs> now, actually, looking at uh, looking at the stats from the past few years, uh, 2019 was, uh, you know, ac across the board stat-wise, your, your best season on tour, uh, most caches. Uh, sitting pretty well in the points. So for you, uh, you know, what was uh, what was kind of helping you or lead to that consistency over the course of the season? And uh, you know, what are some of the biggest things you feel you've learned over the past few years on tour? There's just there's so much that I've learned. Um, I really feel like when I got out of college, I missed out on so much just because we didn't have a tour. I went so many years without competing. Um, and you never realize how much experience you get just actually being there. Uh, you know, and then you have different aspects of it. You have the confidence, you have uh, lane play and ball reaction, and then you have things that you have to work on fundamentally. And there's things that I've had to change in my physical game that were really, really uncomfortable for me. There's things that I've been doing for like 17 years that I just had to push through and just keep working at it just so that I can get better, which unfortunately – it does kind of make you a little bit worse for a little while, but you know what your end result is and what your goal is. And the last year was the first year that if my dad took a video of me, I can look at my game and say, oh, well, thankfully that I'm finally doing it and I don't have to even think about it anymore, which getting to that point was a struggle. I think it took three years to even get to that, that point. You know, all these bowlers want to get better right now and they don't realize how much work and how much heart, like how much you have to actually put into it. You know, and then there's also that aspect of going in the gym and working out and it, not even just working out. It's about doing the proper workouts, getting um, more of an explosive strength than it is just getting bulky and, and getting more muscular. There's just different things that you need to be able to do as a, a competitor that's going to help your game. I think last year, my season, I think my confidence definitely started picking up on my spare shooting. Um which I feel like in the past I've been a very good spare shooter. It's just that I think confidence, when my confidence hit a real low with it, I just started missing things like that I would never miss. And then it was like this big snowball effect that like this panic would hit in. And then, you know, all the ball reps, you can't miss that. You can't do that against these girls. And it was just this one thing that like kept spiraling and you just couldn't get it under control. And, uh, and it had nothing to do because I can go home and practice 10 pins like for days and not miss anything. It was just about being in that environment and being able to manage that that confidence and that that panic level when you're there. I, I'm not even sure if this is something that other bowlers have experienced or even went through. It, it's just something that I had to go through. Um, yeah, I'm pretty I know sure Jacob Butcherf went through it. <laughs> I mean, he he had a lot of trouble making spares on TV, which you know was just kind of a mental thing, but. You know, I, I was watching uh, golf over the weekend, and, and one of the players who was in contention was a guy named Charles Howell III. And um, they had a very interesting statistic they put up on the screen was that he was he's one of the top 20 all-time money earners in PGA Tour history, but he only has three wins in 20 years on tour. Wow. And so I, I'm wondering if that's – I mean, because you're, you're always – it seems like every week you get a check. Um, it's pretty rare, it, you know, I, I, it's very rare that you would ever have like a really bad week where you shoot like 200 under, but you, we don't see yeah. you making a lot of shows and winning. Um, is it, is it just like you said, a confidence thing or is it maybe something like, I know you're a very versatile player, uh, but maybe don't have like, like that a game that's, that's, you know, a shoe in to win, like on a certain week. Is it, what, what do you think, you know, is causing I, uh that? was actually thinking I was going to say that um, if I can s really just define who I am at this moment, I feel like I'm a jack of all trades, but master of none. Honestly, um, I feel like I could play different parts of the lane, different speeds, different hand positions. 
Um, and I think I could get away with manipulating it enough to be able to get through to make the cuts, but I'm not really super amazing at just one of those that where I could, I mean, I, I don't think I ever really get to feel like I get to bowl my A game on tour anyways. I feel like there's always some type of manipulation that has to be happening to get the carry or the, to the pocket or, or whatever it is. Um, I think the one time that I actually got to bowl my A game was at the U S open when I shot 300 there. And um, I think that I started losing my tempo and my timing, you know, you're finally doing something good and then those, those nerves hit and then your feet start getting faster. And then once you start losing your rhythm, it's harder to get back. Um, so I think that being able to manage that situation when I'm finally seeing a little bit of success is important for the future as well. But um, I really, this in the off season, me practicing right now, I've been really trying to just become more consistent, taking things out of my game that will make me less consistent, like my footwork. Um, I've been really trying to relax my hand, get softer with it. I mean, I remember there was a time when someone told me you need to get softer with your hand and I'm almost like, what is that? Like I couldn't even understand it. And now even when I'm softer with my hand, there's still like a new level of softness that you can get to. It's like, it just seems like being completely relaxed with it, not somewhat relaxed with it. It makes a huge difference. And I can see such a difference in practice, at least in practice um, when I'm really relaxed and I get my hand rolling the ball, I can start seeing my game take a new dimension. It just needs a lot more time and work. And you know, I think that um, actually doing it in competition will help me kind of get over the edge. It's a lot easier when you're in, practice you have no pressure your heart is pretty steady but being able to take that level and go into competition and be able to do it is really where i'm going to start seeing my next growing point we do have that video uh from the u.s open that 300 queued up here so let's uh let's take, relive that let's take a quick <laughs> look at that <laughs> do you like how i did the font in pink i did yeah it fits me perfectly yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> number 10 there yep and if i remember correctly jason you were the one that caught this on film too i i did yeah i didn't even yeah. mess it up no <laughs> yeah one of the few times jt yeah it is <laughs> well ashley's comfortable around me so i think that probably had something to do with it yeah we've been friends for a very long time <laughs> This was definitely one of the best experiences of my career, I will say. Especially because my dad was back there and he got to see it. You got a ring for that too, right? I got two rings for that. Two rings, yeah. Two rings. Just give that to Blair and to her own That is a good idea. <laughs> that was, uh, those were pretty, 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 uh, pretty sweet shots there for 300. You know, I honestly, the second shot was, in my opinion, the worst. And then once I got it, I, I felt like I was immediately like, okay, I got this. Like, I relaxed. Like, my 12th shot was a lot better. Yeah. And see, when I went back to my dad, like, he started crying. Whether he meant it or not, he did. And, he, <laughs> and once, I, once I saw him cry, I started crying. It was just like this. For me, it wasn't about the 300. It was more about feeling like I made a breakthrough. Like that was my first professional 300 game. I've, I've shot plenty of 300 games, but that was like the US Open. My dad was there. I've been struggling. Like I, a lot of people don't realize where I've been and everything that I've had to work through for these past, what, 10 years. I, I've been through so much that's, you know, I know this might be horrible to say, but sometimes I really wonder if people were went through what I did or what I had had to go through. I wonder if anybody would have stuck it out because it was there was a lot of hardship. There was a lot of um, just things that have happened that I really don't share with the public. And I still probably won't. But there's a lot that I, as a person, had to overcome with my bowling career and confidence and everything. And I just fight through it because. I want to be a champion one day and I really would like to be that inspiration for a girl or a boy or whoever just to say, Hey, you know what? 
she, it may have taken her four or five years to win a title, but she never gave up. And, you know, and I want to be just like her. I want to know that my dream will come true as long as I keep working at it. I, I hope that I could be an inspiration for someone else. Yeah, I think that's a good point because a lot of people, all they see, you know, we had, we've had this conversation with a number of the players who have been on the podcast. And, you know, it's interesting because I think one player in particular even said all, all people really see is, you know, the, the, the winning at the end of the week or the trophy, but they don't see that there's, you know, 120 other players out there who didn't win that week and they have to, you know, pick themselves up and dust themselves off and get back at it again the next week. And, you know, it's just, it's really the truth of, of the matter is the people that are the most successful ones are the ones that don't give up uh, after they've been, you know, knocked down a few times, right? I remember my first year on tour, if anything, that was the hardest, hardest season I've ever had in my life. It was that constant week after week, just feeling like you're failing over and over again. And it's not even um, a physical game thing. It's more of a mental game thing where you just get yourself into a funk where it just almost starts feeling like it's a spiral. Like one week you miss it, then you miss it again, and then you just miss it again. And it's just like, when is this going to end? And it's, you know, and it's just one of those things that it's not easy to work through that. It's not easy to just come back and say, okay, I'm going to keep putting myself through this every single week. But, you know, I, I the one thing that I think I've always been known for is just that I'm a fighter. Like, I'm always going to fight for my dreams. It doesn't matter what people think of me or what they say about my game or whatever it is. I'm going to keep working hard and I'm going to fight and I'm going to figure something out until one day I'm successful. Uh, Ashley, when you when you kind of talk about that, uh, you know, f fighting through and, uh, you know, the tough 2015 season, when you kind of look at where you started then and, and, you know, all you learned, all you've kind of uh, battled to, to get where you are now. Uh, what does that mean to you just to know how much you've persevered through all this? A lot. Uh, I'm not even the same person as I was back then. Like, uh, just mentally, I mean, it's compl I see bowling so different than I did back then. Um, and I understand more now that there are going to be those bad days. Um, but now when I'm having those bad days, I'm fighting every step of the way to learn something. If I'm going to build bad, I'm sure as hell going to find something that I'm going to learn because if not, that was a waste. That was a waste of a tournament. It was a waste of time. It was a waste of money. But if I could just walk away with just one thing, one thing that I can take from it, then I'm going to grow and that situation will not have to happen again. I think that's a great learning point for a lot of folks out there too, not just for those competing at the professional level, but even uh, uh, for the young players out there who certainly, you know, we, we see it, you know, junior gold and other events where there's a, a discouragement factor, uh, you know, it's not your day, but if there's something you can learn, something you can take away, I think that's a huge, huge thing that uh, more players should be looking at. So Ashley, thank you for that, uh, you know, kind of putting that into perspective too. You're welcome. Yeah, I was kind of curious, you know, the thing that's interesting that people might forget is that uh, you were one of the all-time great youth youth players. You know, you won basically all the biggest tournaments in youth bowling, uh, were one mm -hmm. of the top collegiate bowlers of all time. Um, and then, you know, it's been it's been a little tougher, you know, to find success on tour. But tell tell people, explain to people why the tour is so difficult, you know, versus, you know, some of the other levels that, that um, you had success at. Well, first the competition is way better when you're, when you're a kid and you're bowling four to six hours a day, you're practicing your spares, you're doing it. You're like that one person that's doing it. So you, it's easier to be a little bit more dominant because you're just putting so much more work in when you're at this level whatever you're doing, they're doing, and maybe even more. Like, not everybody shares what they do at home, but whatever you're doing, everybody else is at least doing the same. And um, I also think that seeing so much success as a youth and then coming and then coming through and then seeing so much failure is also something that's really hard because for so long, everybody had all this expectation on me that, well, she was so great when she was a kid. What happened? And, you know, you have all these things that these, it's another thing that you have to overcome and work through. And 
I don't think that, oh, especially with those years, I don't think I've actually worked through that. I think that was just something that really held me back because I just, everything was constantly focused in the past. Oh, I used to do this. I used to be great. I used to be, I used to be, I used to be, you know, instead of worrying, well, this is who I am now. That doesn't matter anymore. You know, I was focusing on the present and where I want to be in the future. Um, when they say the past doesn't equal the future or you need to leave the past in the past, I mean, it's 100% true because the past will only take you down. Take what you can, learn what you can from it, but then forget everything else. I mean, it's really hard to develop that mindset of just having a short-term memory, but when you do, it makes it makes a difference between being able to shoot a 130 and then coming back and shoot a 230. I've literally done that in competition, shoot really bad, and then shoot a 230, and then go back and look at my scorecard and say, what did I shoot my first game? Oh, did I really shoot a 130? Like, that's how far away it is in my mind now that when I shoot a bad game, like, I have to look at the scorecard to remind myself how bad it was. <laughs> <laughs> Got a question from uh, from the uh, uh, the chat. And, and, and by the way, Nicholas, uh, we are working on getting the rest of these podcasts uploaded to Spotify so you can – Listen to them on your uh, on your runs, uh, but but uh, after the three hundred, uh, what's your best tip for not missing that last strike in the three hundred and not missing <sighs> ten pins in an important moment? Um, all right, well we'll we'll start with the the twelfth shot. So there's a couple of different tips that I've there's a couple of different things that I've used to use to try to help me, especially if you haven't bowled the the first three hundred yet. Um, so many people focus on, they start changing their focus halfway through the game. So we can start getting the first five, six strikes in a row. And maybe those first five, six strikes in a row, they were just working on rolling the ball, keeping a relaxed swing, something simple, just hitting the target, whatever it is. But then all of a sudden, after that point, they start realizing they're striking and now their focus is more on the strikes and not necessarily what helped them get there. So the main main thing is that I would keep my focus on whatever's helping me get there. Keep focusing on that, not what you have. Because as soon as you start looking at what you have, you're going to miss it. Um, the next thing is for that, at least that final shot. Um, there's times I've used different strategies. Um, so I know this is going to sound a little crazy, but sometimes I use um, anger to overcome it because I've always been taught that fear and anger can't share the same space. So if I'm starting to feel a little bit nervous, I kind of get mad at myself for feeling nervous and just like, come on, you know, let's go out there and just execute a shot. And I say a lot of other stuff that I, I really can't say on the podcast, but, you know, I, I, I'm talking <laughs> to myself. <laughs> I, I, my father was my coach, and, you know, so that's kind of where I come from. <laughs> so, but I go out there, and then I just think gang a little bit, not to the point where you're crazy. There's always like that, that perfect anger zone. When you get past it, it can be very destructive. But if you can get that, that fire, that, that intensity, that, that can really help you be successful at times. Um, I would do that. And I remember another time I was on, I had to go shoot, a, I was, had the front 11. And I don't know what my boyfriend did, but he did something that day that made me really, really angry. Right before I did that shot, I just thought of that. And I was just like, I just pure it. Like, I was just like, there was no questions asked. Uh, was, it, was this the current boyfriend? or? Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. It was the current one. Okay. Well, it's good that you, you still be able to use that in the future. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know you've done a lot of coaching. Um, yes. Are, are you still involved with that? And um, if so, what are you what are you doing? And, and uh, what are some of the, you know, things that you do, you know, with respect to your coaching? Well, I have, first have to say is a lot of people don't realize that I coach as much as I do. Like I, when I'm home, like I'm fully coaching all the time. Like I absolutely love it. I teach every single age group from literally from five years old to like 90 years old to seniors who just want to get their average to 150 to uh, six year olds that want to be the next, uh, Jason Belmonte or Chris Prather. And uh, it's just, it's so much fun being able to work with different groups. I will say that I've been coaching a lot of two handers lately and I, I just, I have so much fun with them. I think that the two handed game, I know that there's a lot of people who don't like the game out there, but there is still a lot to it that a lot of people don't realize about the game. And uh, I just, I just love bowling in general. So I'm just so happy that I have this opportunity to coach 
all of it. Um, I will say that I am pretty confident that I have a couple of my kids that are going to be on the PBA tour one day and they're going to be champions. Like there's no, there's no doubt in my mind. Like I have several of them that are just fantastic. They work hard. They're just talented and they listen to me. Um, That's amazing. I, yeah, I, I love it. Try to get my kids to listen to somebody. <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes I think I'm actually even a better. Like sometimes I think I'm so much of a better coach than I am a bowler because I'm like, I know these are the things that you're supposed to do. I know why. I know how they're going to benefit from it. And then I get myself on video, and I'm like, just, why can't I do it? <laughs> <laughs> What's the difference between coaching, you know, the two-handed game versus one-handed? There's. There's there is a lot of similarities to it, but there's also um, a lot of things that are different. So there's no shell that you can really teach with two handed. There's just so many different styles. I mean, you have the Kyle Troop, who is a two hander, who, in my opinion, is like a one handed two hander. He has the walk. He has more of the body motions as a one hander. Where you have Jason Belmonte, who has that big dip with his step and swoops over, and, and they do it for specific different reasons too. I mean, part of it's that's that's what their game is. Um, you know, like Jason, he when he does that move, I think it helps him get his hips open. It's also understanding why certain bowlers do it and what they need. Just like a one hander, a lot of people don't realize that our body types aren't meant to do the same thing as each other. So if you look at my game, I. I'm double jointed. I'm flexible in my shoulder. So I can, my swing can go straight up behind me and not move just because of my, my range of motion that I have on my arm. There's other people who don't have that. So you have to really look at their body types and see what they need as an individual and just implement these key things that will help them get better because maybe everybody doesn't look the same, but at certain key points in their game, they all get to a certain position at a certain time and they do certain things the same. And it's just about how can we get to that spot more consistently and more efficiently. Um, the two-handers get way more body angle. Um, I do think that Anthony Simonson has a lot more knee bend than most of the, the two-handers on tour. A lot of them have a little less because they have so much body angle. Um, it, it's also about being able to balance that with my students because if they get that 90-degree body angle and now they're bending their knees – they have to lift up to the foul line because they're going to slam the ball into the lane. Like they're going to actually hit the ball into the lane if they don't do it. So it's really about finding a good balance with that. Um, they're, they're set up. I've actually learned this um, from one of my friends. He said that most two handers don't actually use fingertip. They actually more of like a semi or even sometimes conventional. And he said that that actually helps them get the ball more on their forearm. And that was something that I've learned. And I ex kind of experimented it with my students. And it actually was uh, something that helped them out tremendously. Like I didn't even realize that that was even a thing at the time. Um, so I'm even still learning as a coach. Uh, I always tell my students, uh, I feel like I've educated myself a lot to be able to help them. But if there's something I don't know, I will find out. I don't claim to know everything, but if I don't know it, I will do everything I can to find out what the answer is. Ashley, while we're talking about it, and we can definitely hear the, the passion you have for coaching, where, what is the best? Uh, what is the best place for folks who you know might want to get a lesson uh, to reach out to you uh, to kind of set something up? Generally, uh, right now, the best way to contact me is through Instagram, uh, Facebook. Uh, it's been a little bit a lot harder for me to manage. Um, my messages get very, very long, and it's just sometimes I'm the type of person where I love being able to interact and talk to people and be able to stay in touch with them, but sometimes I do feel like I get a little bit overwhelmed with the messages from Facebook, and I always feel bad because I feel like something always gets missed, um, and I really, I really try my best not to. Uh, but Instagram seems a little bit easier for me to manage. So whenever people want a lesson, um, I coach out of Maple Lanes uh, in Clearwater. Um, does gotcha. that kind of answer your question? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Just, uh, you know, for folks in the area who who might be interested in, in some coaching and, uh, you know, you kind of mentioned social media and uh, you're, you're arguably one of the most popular players out there as far as number of fans. And, you know, in looking at, you know, those pages, you have hundreds and hundreds of comments for almost every post 
and you kind of talked about it, but uh, you know, what's it like just having all that, uh, you know, all that attention, all, all the, you know, congratulations, great bowling, <laughs> uh, looking forward to, to see you bowling again, all that kind of stuff. Uh, what's it like kind of being a fan favorite out there? I, I just feel so blessed. Um, the amount of support and that I have from people is incredible. I, I haven't won a title. I haven't proven myself yet. And there's just so many people that are rooting for me and they, they want to see me successful. They, they talk to me, they send me messages, tell me how they're, they want to see me, you know, in that winter circle. And if I do win, they're really excited for me. And, uh, I, I'm just so, I, I guess I'm just so grateful to have them, uh, and just have this opportunity. I, I really do I love the sport. I love every aspect of it. I love competing. I love coaching. I love the people. I mean, we have such awesome people in this industry and I've gotten to meet so many of the fans just by being on the road. And I, I love talking to them. I know that some of them will even come up to me after a bad day on uh, the lanes and I'll say, can we talk to you tomorrow? I, I know that I want to get your autograph, but I don't want to bother you because I know that you didn't bowl well. And for me, I'm like, my bad bowling has nothing to do with you guys. I, I have all night to dwell on that. But right now, let's talk. Let's have fun. Let's, I, I get to meet you. Like that, you know, there for me, there has to be a switch on and off switch. There's a time and place for me to be upset my bowling. It, it's not it's not my time to to take that out on anybody else. So I, I love I actually feel like I like being able to talk to them and uh you know, even just talk about my experiences or whatever, just because that's the moment that I was in. I get to meet people that I talk to on Instagram or Facebook or whatever. And I, I just love every, I love everybody that I get to meet through this sport. Very, very cool. And we, we actually have one person in the uh, Facebook chat who, who is going to get enough uh, courage to ask you to bowl doubles with him. So uh, Scott. Bull, so. <laughs> Hi, Scott. Hope you're doing well, buddy. Me and Scott actually bowled on Team USA together a long time ago. He's one of my best friends. We stay in touch. He, uh, it's so funny because we'll have a conversation at least once a month. We'll talk about coaching ideas and strategies. And uh, honestly, I, if anybody in the Minnesota area, you need to get lessons from him. He's a fantastic coach. He has so much knowledge about the equipment. He's a ball driller. He just got everything. So, Shout out to Scotty. Yeah. What are what are some of your? I mean, you know, you talked about how you love everybody on social media. Um, I, I have you know some people that I've run into on social media that I would have a hard hard time loving. Um, <laughs> well, well, how do you deal with uh, the negative aspect of of social media? What what is your what, hmm. what's your strategy? What advice would you have for somebody who you know is is uh, not interested in you know troll bowling? The negative co there are always those negative comments. Um, I've had been made fun of for crying after my 300 or the fact that they thought that I was wearing a wrist glove. Oh, she couldn't bowl it without it when I really wasn't even wearing a wrist glove. I was wearing like one of the ones that kind of go around your wrist this way. It wasn't, it had actually no effect on my wrist at all. Um, I, I think I take it for what it's worth. I mean, do those comments hurt? They're always going to hurt. I mean, to, for someone to say that they don't hurt, they're probably just lying. Um, but then you have to think about it. For them to, for me, sometimes I think I actually feel bad for them, that they feel the need that they have to go out and criticize and talk bad about people. I mean, I wouldn't want to go out and talk bad about somebody or even if it's something for a different sport. Like, I don't have that interest. I feel like I'm the kind of person I'm so happy with where my life is and whatever that I wouldn't want to do that. So what kind of life would someone have that they have that need to talk so bad about somebody? Like, does that make you happy? Like, I, I can't see that making me happy. So I, I just don't understand it. So I try to take it more of an understanding and actually feel more bad for them than I do like upset about the comment or whatever, just because I don't know. That's, that's just my opinion on it. It could be wrong. Um, yeah. Well, I was, the reason I ask is it just seems <laughs> like you're doing it the right way. I mean, you know, it's very easy for somebody, you know, who becomes popular on social media to get wrapped up in the negative comments and then have it, you know, influence the way they handle themselves on social media and go in a negative direction, which you never seem to do. So I was well, just ulti ultimately, my dad always taught me that you should you should hold people's um, opinions higher to how much space they hold in your heart. So 
for me, if my dad said something horrible about my game or about me, that would devastate me. But if I don't know someone and they say something, then they I don't value their opinion enough to know if I sh how I should even take if I should take that even personally. They they don't a lot of people they don't know me. They don't I've been somebody said that I was not even a nice person. I had reached I'd reached that per like that comment. And honestly, sometimes I wonder what did I do to that person that they even feel that way? Because I feel like I always try to go out of my way to um to be myself all the time and not let my bad bowling affect how I treat people or whatever. So uh, I, I don't know. I just, there's always going to be those comments. There's always going to be those people. And, um, you know, and sometimes I'll try to respond back to them and say, I'm sorry that you feel that way just because maybe I could explain a situation different. Maybe, uh, maybe they're just, their opinion of something isn't really like, the maybe the way they wrote it wasn't the way I read it. You know, sometimes maybe even investigating it a little bit more and just taking that. Well, what do you mean by this? Like, well, this isn't true because of this, or you know, and actually have a discussion with them instead of attacking them. The problem is, is that people always want to attack each other on social media instead of really just trying to find out where someone's coming from. Um, and I, for you, if you don't know this, I'm Virgo, so I'm the kind of person who I always try to see both sides of stuff then before I make a decision on something. So I like to investigate. <laughs> Sounds like uh, they should have you give me some lessons in Congress. <laughs> <laughs> JT, JT, JT. There's a lot of weird <laughs> stuff going on in Congress right now. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly so. Ashley, I wanted to get back to uh, one of the things you had mentioned a little bit earlier in the podcast. You talked about uh, kind of feeling like a jack of all trades, but a master of none. And uh, one of the things, JT, you often bring up about uh, the players on tour who kind of make the leap to the next level is being A, really good at one thing, or B, really being really consistent across the board. So Ashley, uh, you know, for you to make that next leap, um, you know, what do you think has to happen with your game to uh, essentially go from being a steady casher to a player who is in the position to win week in and week out? Before I answer that, I'm going to just bring up one point. I thought you were going to say you're going to go check on your dog because he hasn't barked in like 20 minutes. <laughs> they probably fell asleep. <laughs> so. That's good. Sorry. Um, no, you're fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> so every year that I bowled on tour, I feel like I miss so many cuts. But the two cuts that I never miss would be Queens and U.S. Open, which is always double points. Mm -hmm. This year, I made all the cuts. And I missed the cuts at Queens and U.S. Open. I missed the cut at Queens by 20 pins, and U.S. Open was just a disaster. I, I had food poisoning, and I just had no ball motion. Honestly, even if I didn't have food poisoning, I don't think it would have affected anything, like on my results in that tournament. But, um, but you thinking back at those two events, if I just make just the first cut, just the first one, that all that automatically would just increase my standings by a lot. You know, and now those are events that I never missed the cut at. So, like, it's to me is like mind blowing that I finally had this great season and then I missed the cut at both of the events. Um, so, with that being said, uh, I think that getting what's going to really help me get to the next level is a couple of things. First, I do feel like I lack in confidence. Um, it, it's not easy to admit to something like that because you always want to walk around saying, oh, I believe in myself, I'm going to win. You know, you, you have these things that you're telling yourself that. But there's a difference between telling yourself that and actually feeling it and believing it. And there's videos on YouTube when I was 16 years old bowling on Teen Masters, and I watched that video, and I'm like, you were a little cocky little, you know, kid back then. I see my smirk. I don't even care if I lost that tournament. I was up there. I left the split. I smiled before because I knew I was going to make it. Like, just having that confidence – it is a game breaker. I mean, a game changer. Sorry. Like that makes a difference between you could take a bowler who doesn't have a great game, but if they can repeat shots and they have that confidence, they do so well just because confidence plays that huge role in the game. And when you don't have it, it, I think, I think John was John Gaines. He told me this confidence is that thing that when you have it, you feel like you can never lose it. And when you don't have it, you feel like you can never get it back. And that is probably the truest statement I've ever heard in my life because I've been on both ends of that point. And I think that my next growing point is I really got to just get out there, compete, 
and start believing in myself more. Um, I need to stop comparing myself to everybody else and and trying to be picture perfect. I have this crazy head movement. You know, I'm working on it, but when I'm in the middle of competition, I just need to let it go. If it's there that day, it's there. I can't I can't try to fix my physical game while I'm blowing competition just so I can look pretty. Like I need to go out there and I need to do what feels right to me because I still have some natural ability and I need to be able to trust in that. Not how I actually look on the lane if I look like I have a perfect little arm, no head movement. You know, I mean, that's something that I, you know, I will keep working on. Hopefully one day it'll be there, but you have to stop worrying about the things that don't matter and focus on the things that are going to help you be successful. And um, I think another thing that will help me be uh, make it to that next level would also be more consistency. Um, I feel like my release isn't as consistent as I would like it to be. I think it's in the right direction right now. And I think I've been working on it. And I think I have a good game plan for it. But I do overall have to get better at repeating shots and just being able to have a more consistent release. <laughs> I, I can't read any of the comments. Oh. So far away. Oh, it's, right. <laughs> it said, it's from Scott. It, 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 I'll just read the second sentence. It says, yes, you were a cocky person. <laughs> uh yeah i mean that's it's an interesting point i mean i you know in my book i wrote about there's three kind of ingredients to success one is setting goals one is believing in yourself and one is working hard and the working hard part is is easy if you have the first two because it's something you want so it's not really working hard but um you know th that's the thing people don't understand i think out of all those things, it's really easy to understand setting goals. It's really easy to understand working hard, but but managing your confidence and the fact that it is something that you can manage and have to manage is is I think the hardest thing for people to understand. I think they they just either assume you have confidence or you don't, right? Like like John yeah. comment. Uh, but I mean, what are you doing to try to manage your confidence to to you know bring bring that back? I think that right now what I'm doing is I'm just competing more to manage it because the I think before this, I would just, okay, I didn't bowl well at the tournament. I'm going to go home and just practice. And I wouldn't even bowl tournaments on the weekends. I just sit there, practice, 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 practice. But you don't gain you don't gain that much confidence from practice, unfortunately, because you need to be in those situations where you feel that pressure and you're successful underneath it, like when it happens. And eventually, when you are under so much pressure consistently, eventually you start learning to manage it and deal with it and start overcoming it. And then when you start overcoming it, you start getting this confidence. And then and then now all of a sudden starting to snowball in the right direction instead of the wrong direction. And um, I, you know, every every event, I'm just taking something out of it, like something that I did really well from that tournament. And I'm really proud of, the bowler that I am, like there, I do a success log. So there's, th you write down after every competition practice, whatever it is, three things you did well. You write three things that you did well because that makes you feel good. Feeling good is a part of being confident. Then you write one thing that you can improve on. Okay, my footwork wasn't the best this day. We gotta keep working on the footwork. Then you make a plan of action. Okay, well, what am I gonna do to get better? And then you make a couple of little notes. Okay, this is what I'm going to do, dot, 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 dot. You know, and now you feel good because you know what you need to work on. But now you have a game plan. So now you're like, okay, I got this. Now now you're starting to go in the right direction. And then when you get that down, you can check it off the list. And now, okay, well, what's next? What do I got to get better at next time? And then now you start feeling good about yourself. It, it's not the easiest. It is, it is something that you have to work at. Um, but... If you have a strategy and you just stick to it and you keep pushing through it, I, I think eventually it's going to come. I, I know I'm not as confident as I will be, but I feel so much better about myself and who I am than, than I did maybe even a year ago. So I know I'm going in the right direction. That was some uh, good stuff there, Ashley. I really like the uh, success log. Uh, we've heard folks talk about, you know, keeping journals, keeping, you know, different things throughout the course of their competitions. That's the first time I've really heard one described in that fashion. Uh, so I'm sure you might get a few questions about that coming up <laughs> because it it, it it sounds like a great way to continue to build progress. Uh, you, you know, you're taking the good, 
there's things to work on and there's process and progress throughout all of it. So thank you for sharing that because I think that's going to be helpful for a lot of folks uh, listening and looking ahead to their next tournament. You're welcome. Yeah, I, I uh, you know, I, I think I believe that, you know, one of the ways that you can start to turn your conference in, in another direction is to set some smaller goals for yourself. Uh, and yeah. then you accomplish those smaller goals and then your confidence builds and then you set larger goals. Now, uh, do you have goals that you set for yourself before the start of a tour season? And, and you know, what what are your goals for the upcoming, you know, when the tour resumes? Um, well, I did. I remember last season I had um, I actually bought this book. Um, I can't remember what the name of it because I took the cover off of it because I didn't want it to get ruined. But it actually is like this huge, like detailed, like goal setting book that you go through and it just breaks down each goal to the finest of how you're going to like, even to like, what do you want to give up to get this goal and everything. Um, and I set a lot of goals for last season and I was either, I accomplished a lot of it or I was really, really close. Um, so for the next season, I definitely, for the points list, I want to be ranked at least in the top 20. I was, I ranked like 27, 28 this past season. Um, so I want to be at least in that 20 and up. Um, I think that as a goal, I want to just be comfortable in the lanes, feeling good about my game, uh, and just being smarter. Um, it, it, when it comes down to it, you can throw, you can execute a good shot at this level, but you also have to be able to stay ahead of ball motion, blind ball changes. Um, I really would like to be able to rely more on myself, um, and something that I've been doing lately is making a decision and sticking with it and just going with my gut instinct. Um, so when I'm debating between two thoughts, well, I really think, well, what do I, what feels right to me? And then I go and I grab that ball or I make that choice and I stick with it because I have to trust my gut. It may, I don't even know if it's right or wrong, but at, at that point in time, if that was, is what feels right, that I'm just going to do it because there has to, that's the better option in my opinion. Um, Moving forward, I think that overall being more consistent is something that's going to help me. Well, I want to be more consistent on tour. I want to have a higher spare shooting percentage, not just on single pins. I want to be able to make those multi multiple pin spares, the, the washouts. Um, I want to just be able to make sure I'm better at closing frames, managing the better the bad games better, and taking full advantage of my good games. Um, I also would like to be able to hand, handle more pressure situations better. And what that means is last year, not last year, the year before, um, I had a bowl against Shannon O'Keefe and I needed to strike out in Queens. That was the year that she won. If I struck out, I would have won, went on to win the next match. I mean, went on to bowl the next match. Yeah. And I just threw the ball like garbage. Like I didn't even give myself a chance. And it's really disappointing because one thing that I can remember from being a, a youth bowler was that I was always really, really clutch. And anytime I needed a strikeout, I always did that. I executed great shots. Um, if I even if I didn't strike out, I always gave myself a chance. I hit the pocket. I executed a good shot. The pins fall, they fall. That's all you can do sometimes. And I would like to be find more of that person back. It, I think that maybe that person maybe have gotten lost along the way, but I don't think it's gone. I think if you've had it once before, it's something you'll have again. And that is something that I can have confidence in because I remember that person. I remember how I was. So knowing that I can, I can be that again is exciting. And I do believe that that will happen. And that is my goal is to find my way back to that person. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I always used to laugh when people, when Tiger Woods was hurt and they said, well, he's never going to win again. And I, I would say, well, if he can get healthy, he's going to win again because he knows how to win. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's that's the same you know, with you, you're going to find you, as long as you keep putting yourself in that position, you'll, you'll remember what it was that, you know, made you successful in the first place. Yeah, I agree with that. Thank you, and Jason. I, I just compared you to Tiger Woods, by the way. I noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was a huge compliment. <laughs> <laughs> Now, as we hit the uh, right around the hour mark of the show, I know we got uh, one or two questions left to go. Uh, JT, I know you had a question about uh, jerseys. Yeah, I know. Uh, I saw a really, while well, I was stalking you on social media, uh, I saw a really cool picture of a wanted poster um, 
on your jersey. And I know you have your own jersey line. So why don't you talk about that? <laughs> I have so much desire, so much fun designing jerseys. Um, so I'm on staff with Logo Infusion, and I work a lot with Jennifer and Je yeah Jennifer, and she just always is able to take my ideas and just really express them on the shirts. Um, I like to I like to hit every single type of person, like men, females, uh, boys, girls. Uh, I want to find a way to be able to create jerseys that they are going to want. Because uh, I think too many of us, especially being females, we try to find jerseys that we like for ourselves and not necessarily think about what, you know, our, our followers would like to actually wear. So I put a lot of thought, I mean, no matter what, when I make a jersey, I still want it to be a jersey that I would like to wear. But I always have them in my mind, well, what would they might like to see? So that jersey uh, was my cowboy jersey. And if you look at the front, like I have like a little scarf and everything, and I have like the cowboy vest. And on the back of it, it's the most wanted. It's, it's a Western themed jersey. Um, this jersey that I'm wearing right now is my Witcher Yennefer design. I absolutely loved her dress. I thought it was really cool. I'll even stand up so you can kind of see it. That it was like one of her dresses that she wore. And um, I have a, like a fairy princess, not princess, it's like unicorns and sparkly. Uh, and it has fairies all over it. I have that jersey for like little girls that may like it. Um, I also like to take my favorite cartoons like I love He-Man and Shiro something that I grew up with and I even have a Shiro jersey that I love and it's actually so cool because there's a lot of people who have been buying it men and females and I, I just think it's like so cool just to see it on people like I, I love seeing my designs on others because it's something that I'm really passionate about and I put so much time and effort into every jersey that I put into. Like I go through Shutterstock, I'll spend hours just searching through pictures and then putting other images together to design what I want. Nice. Do you know yeah. I can I can do Skeletor's voice? <gasps> can I hear it? Yeah, you can hear it. Hey man, you will pay for your insolence. <laughs> Oh, I love it. <laughs> and, and speaking of Skeletor, whenever things are back up, I was actually planning on making a Skeletor jersey in the future. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, would, I, I, would I fully expect you to wear that one. Yeah, I, I would wear that. I would buy that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> JT, you gotta do the whole podcast in that voice one time. I, yeah, I think I will. Oh. Yeah, it's yeah, it's fun. I, I like doing skeleton. I'm not. I'll, I'll send you. I'll send you the jersey so you can wear the jersey and then do the voice. That would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Yes. <sighs> wow. So what? That's logo infusion, right? Like, where can they yes. where to find those jerseys? So under Logo Infusion's um, website, they have um, professional rep replica jerseys. Um, so if you click that, then it has men and female pros, and then you go to the female pros, and then you'll see my face. And when you click it, it'll have my whole line of jerseys. Uh, I think we are working on still getting some of my older jerseys um, put up on the site, but they have a lot of lot to choose from. Uh, <laughs> sorry. It's okay. I, I love talking about the jerseys because it's, <laughs> so, it's, it's so much fun for me. But um, yeah, it's, I, I love, we have such a great relationship and all of the jerseys are made in the USA, which is something that I really like. Um, I always love being involved with companies where it's very family orientated and they make me feel really welcomed. And it, it's not just a business with them. It's just, it's more of like a friendship and a family. And um, they're, they're awesome people. I, they treat me so great. And uh, they deal a lot with me because, like, I'm, you know, I'm really am picky when the jerseys come. Like, Jennifer knows what she's dealing with. <laughs> she <goes laughs> with me. Like, like, I think she might be the only one who could deal with me at this point in time because I'm so picky because I, I have this image in my head of what I want. And, you know, and she actually gets it now. Like, she will start putting, she gets what I want. And she'll be able to uh, just take my my thoughts and like bring it to reality, which is awesome. There we go. Yeah. Which actually that the red Panther Jersey so far, um, was, is like probably my most popular one, the galaxy Jersey. Um, if you look right there, the one with the heart. So that one has a lot of meaning to me. 
Um, I always like to say the reach for the um, reach for the galaxy because I feel like it's past the sky or past the, you know, past the stars. Yeah. Past the stars, reach for the galaxy, you know, um, and the heart represents the heart and soul that I put into the bowling. So it's like a zipper of me, like actually revealing my heart that I put into, you know, bowling. That's cool. Uh, yeah. And uh, there's another galaxy. I will always have galaxy jerseys in there because I feel like they represent my hopes and dreams. Um, I like the Rose uh, jersey just because my middle name is Rose. And if you actually look at the back of my jersey, on every jersey, it says Ashley Galante. And in between it, it has a rose coming out of my Y. And it stands for Ashley Rose Galante. So I always have my middle name in there. It's just, I always put little hidden things in my jerseys, whether people realize it or not. And it's the same thing with my logo, too. Uh, my logo has, like, three dimensions to it. So Very cool. Very cool, yes. Yeah. All right, JT, uh, I have one question left on my sheet. Uh, yeah, the question. Are, are, we're ready for that moment. Yeah, let's do it. All right, Ashley, uh, we've been uh, asking most of the folks on the podcast this question. So uh, for everybody watching at home, what are the Ashley Galante binge watch recommendations? Oh, there's so many. <laughs> <laughs> so many. Uh, definitely with The Witcher blew my mind. Like, I think we watched that in one day, me and Blair. Like, it's bad that we watched that much in one day, but it was so good. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was just so good. <laughs> Uh, I know that the An Umbrella Academy and the boys are starting to come out with their season two. They, those two shows have been really good. I loved Ozark. Um, we're watching Shameless right now. And that that's just a train wreck that you just can't yeah. look away from. Like, it's that, just one of those shows that. <laughs> that is um, a fair point. Are you just and, starting and, uh, or, or? No, I think we're in season five, four or five now. Okay. So it's we got pretty deep into that one. Gotcha. There's also, we like Gotham. And you, I say we, like that's the shows me and my boyfriend both watch. Um, and we watched The Office like every, and we've rewatched that multiple, multiple times. Like that's our going to sleep show. Like, okay, I'm going to go to sleep. Let me put that on. Just listen to it. <laughs> and we probably watched that series like what, like nine or 10 times already. <laughs> wow. Do you guys have like, are there shows that only you watch without, without? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What's, what were those ones? <sighs> hmm. I have to think, cause it's been a while since I found a really good show that I like by myself that he doesn't like. I watched lock and key by myself. He started it and didn't really care for it so much. So I finished it on my own. Gotcha. Um, <sighs> That happens a lot. I, I think I think I think that because I run out of things that I like to watch, I start watching some more like kitty stuff. Like I like things that don't really stress me out. Something I just kind of put on the background. Um, oh, I can't remember. It was like Kate and Alexia. This is the one with the girl who had cancer, and you know she's in high school, and her friend shaves her head. Too. I, I watched. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I can't remember the name of that, but yeah, I, yeah. My daughter watched it. I, I didn't. I didn't watch it, but yeah, I, no, I, yeah. It, it really is like, it, it's a, probably a children's show. And I, I've watched the whole thing. Cause I, I just, I like that feel good, like family life. I, I don't know, <laughs> but, um, I, there's really not much that I watch without him because we and him really like the same stuff. Um, we do, we like a lot of, does he get mad at you if you watch something without him? No, I get mad at him if he watches it without uh, me. Yeah. That's how it is in my house too. <laughs> yeah, she gets mad at me, but I can't get mad at her. No, he doesn't get mad at me he, he, at all. Like if I was, he, if I watched. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I said. Like she, my wife gets mad at me if I watch something without her, but she, you know, if, no. if, if she I'll watched get, something without me, I wouldn't care. I'll get home and I'll see him watching it and I'd be like, what are you doing? This is our, <laughs> this is our show. It's outrageous. <laughs> now I have to I watch can't, it I can't, myself to catch up. Right. Exactly. Another, actually another show that we watch that's really good is Westworld. I don't know if you've watched that one yet. I haven't, but I, I heard it's good. Mm -hmm. That one's pretty yeah. good. Yeah. We like a lot of the, the sci-fi shows. Um, we like the superhero stuff. Me and him, the only thing that I don't watch is horror films. Like I, I'll watch th even thrillers, but horror stuff's not really for me. And I haven't, the older I get, the less I like 
romantic movies. Like I just kind of have no more interest in watching stuff like that. So I think me and him just like watching the same stuff now. <laughs> because you're you're living it, right? You're living the romance. Oh no, he taught me that <laughs> that none of that is real. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, see. I see. Well, I know one. <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding. One other thing I know you like a lot is uh, like online gaming apps. Or yes. yeah, so you're like way into games. So what are your game app uh, recommendations? Okay, so I have the Switch. I do I do like video games. I will say I don't play nearly as much as I used to because um, I'm an addict. Like I won't stop <laughs> playing it like that. So I have to like keep myself under control. Like I probably wouldn't even go to work the next day. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. But seriously. Uh, I like playing Zelda. I will binge play that until I finish it. Um, I play right now. Switch just did a free download for the Nintendo 64, where they have a game called Panel de Pond, which is an old Tetris Attack game. Oh and yeah, I remember when you destroyed me playing Tetris Attack. <laughs> I mean, it was like so. You gave me like a couple months to practice, and I I actually did, and it still <laughs> didn't help. Uh, yeah. Me and, me and my dad, w growing up, uh, I've always been really close to my dad. Uh, so me and him would always, like, watch movies together, and then we play video games. And there was times where we literally would stay up all night playing video games. And that was one of the games that we played. And he used to get so mad because he could never – we both started playing no, yeah, at the yeah, same yeah. time, and he could never beat me. I don't think anybody in the world could beat you at that game. It's, it's like, <laughs> ridiculous. Uh, you know, I've I, you know since I haven't played it in a while, I've actually am pretty rusty in it. But uh, there's yeah, I don't believe I'm not. Uh, I'm it. sure there's plenty of people that beat me, but <laughs> it's like riding a bike. But I, I like all the Switch games. I've had a lot of fun playing the Donkey Kong and the the Mario Odyssey games. Like they're just they're fun. I actually had a lot of fun playing Luigi's Mansion as well. Um, yeah. I, I will say I probably like more of the kitty games, and my boyfriend likes more of the uh, the adult like. Yeah. playing Diablo. And I mean, I played those games with him too. Um, I like Rocket League as well. I'm really, really bad at it. I'm also really bad at Super Smash Brothers, but I'll play it anyways. I'm decent yeah. at Mario Kart. So, um, I, if, you know, if I was younger and there was a lot more time, I'd probably play a lot more. But unfortunately, it just seems like um, my time as I got older, you know, just trying to you know, to be an adult, you know, you go to work in the morning and then you have to practice and then you have to go work out and then you have to take care of the animals and you just yeah. almost don't have that much time to yeah, do anything. I, I know. I agree. I'm going to, I'm going to turn my thing here. See that thing sitting right there. What's that? It looks like kids pictures. It's, well, that's kids pictures, but then there's <laughs> like right oh. next to that. Where am I? There's my finger. The, right the, there. the computer. Right there. That is a, an original PlayStation. Oh, oh, yeah. I can't see. Yeah, <laughs> the yeah. PlayStation. JT. That is the PlayStation. original. So, yeah. what games do you like on there? Uh, well, the, there's really only one game I play on there, which is Brunswick Circuit Pro Bowling, which is the best. <laughs> I think. Well, I haven't played the new PBA game. I heard it's pretty good, and I and I played <laughs> I played Belmo's game. He gave me a copy of it like before it came out, and I was really good. Yeah, um, that one's actually pretty good. Yeah, but I I. I still, I mean, Brunswick Circuit Pro Bowling is pretty freaking awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I will have to say, I I have a lot of fun playing Jason's game, but generally, bowling games, I don't know why, but I don't enjoy playing them so much. Yeah, it's I like, feel you know, like they're just not realistic enough for me. But J Jason is really like it is actually really good. close to yeah. it, so I enjoy like because he actually has like sport shots out there, and, and yeah. you have to like try to figure it out. So he yeah. added like a different dimension to the game. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. only thing I don't like about Brunswick Circuit Pro is that the lanes don't change. So, like, once you oh. figure them out, you just you average 260. And so, yeah. that, that, as fun as that sounds, uh, <laughs> it's not. It's, it's, it's not. You know, the real bowl, there's nothing like real bowling, you know. Well, I, I was so excited about the Wii bowling, except for the fact that you have to, like, do this with the controller to get the ball yeah. to do something right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Nothing, nothing, nothing as good as real Good old fashioned bowling. Actually, yeah, I agree. Very true. Do you do you think that the um, the edge string is going to take off? Well, from what you guys saw, I don't know. It, it could. I'm sorry, I might be. I might be putting you yeah. on the spot for this. I'm I mean, sorry. I mean, um, 
I know it's, I mean, it's, it's a lot less expensive, you know, to, yeah. for a center to, to build that way. Um, so, I, you know, it could, but, um, you know, I, I, I believe that, you know, bowling is bowling and all bowling is good, but there's nothing better than, you know, the game that we've had for the last 120 years. I mean, it's just, yeah. there's a reason why it's lasted so long and, uh, so many people have been good at it and, you know, it would be a shame for that history to, you know, go away. So, you know, I, I think in my mind, there's, there's nothing like good old fashioned, you know, 10 pin bowling. Do you know who started bowling? Who? The Egyptians. Oh, no, I, I did. I did. I mean, yeah. that, that's, that's, that's not, it's okay. So let's, let's just okay. do a little fact okay. check here. Uh, so, so there. I, were, I read. I read that fact straight from. I think it was USBC. So if my facts are well, wrong. It, yeah. So there was there were um, in a tomb of a, an Egyptian child. There were artifacts that resembled bowling pins, mm -hmm. and so, but they didn't know for sure what those were. They assumed it was you know a toy that the child liked that looked like it could be played like bowling. So that's where that is credited oh, okay. to. But Europeans really invented bowling. Uh, so, you know, they're the true beer drinking schlubs that uh, invented, invented bowling. So, uh, but, but, you know, it yeah. could have, it could have been played in Egypt. It's just that there's not enough of a historical record to prove that, you know, beyond that the makes sense. Without. Yeah. Yeah. I think from the article or whatever I read off of it was that they had like these old like little wooden bowling balls and it was something that they were they actually did um, indoors like I don't it was I don't I can't remember it was it's been a the while Egyptians? since I read it yeah but I I I'll have to see if I can find that article and um, send it to you because okay. um, what I was doing the reason why I even came across it was when I had uh, I'm in. I don't know if you know this, but I'm also the youth president of our Saturday morning program. So I'm the youth president and head coach. So I was putting together these little binder books for the kids and I was trying to educate them while making it fun. So like I have like little pictures for them in the color and then have like a background story behind it. Yeah. And I do like these crossword puzzles for them and like, you know, just try to do something fun for them. Yeah. And that was one of the articles I came and a lot of it came out of like um, one of the coaching books that we had, like, okay. just like a lot of these little print ups. So I just remember it was always really cool. Yeah. I've actually, I, if I find it, I'll have to send it to you. Yeah, please do. Cause I'm actually working on a project for the hall of fame downstairs where we're renovating the um, history of bowling video that plays in the big theater downstairs. So I've been actually researching that. So if you find something new that we can work in, let me know. Cause we're going to yeah. be working on that video here pretty soon. Oh, that's cool. Well, Ashley, it's been a, a true pleasure to have you on today. I know, I know you got to check on your dog and make sure he's not, uh, you know, has not <laughs> passed out or you know, something. Cause he's I bet you what I want. I bet you when I walk in the room, one's going to be laying on the bed and the other one's going to be laying on his bed. So like we're going to have one here, one down here. <laughs> because because it'd be the worst thing in the world if they lay together. That's just not going to happen. Okay. Okay. Well, okay. I hope that didn't happen. <laughs> I, I really appreciate you guys having me on the show today. I had a blast and um, I just wanted, I just want to say thank you for this opportunity. You're welcome. Thank you. We yeah. really appreciated it as well. We'll hope to have you on again soon. Oh, that'd be great. Have a great week. You Good too. Luck. Good luck with, uh, with the... Uh... <laughs> yeah, that's, well, he just started his job today, so okay. he's ran out of excuses by I now. I mean, you know, two weeks, he'll have his first paycheck, and that's, to me, that's the date, right? I mean, that's... I, I, I think what's going to happen is he's going to end up proposing to me on the day that I have planned for us to get married. <laughs> <laughs> Well, perfectly. Well, you know, I tell Kimberly Pressler told me one thing that I will never forget, and I use it to this day, is my ring is going to be like a fine wine. The longer I wait, the better it better be. <laughs> <laughs> That's great advice for all the guys out there. <laughs> yeah, get that ring right now, guys. Get it right now. Don't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that.
Thank you. Yeah. And we'll, uh, we'll see you soon. See you soon. Bye Bye. guys. Thanks, Ashley. Well, sir, another, uh, successful show. No dogs were harmed. I, at least as far as we know. Correct. And we got a lot into gaming there and I was, I'm, I'm so glad you didn't bring up or bring up uh, that one time I lillied on the, on the <laughs> show bowling. I think I still have the video. On I, I think I, I do as yeah. well. So yeah, it, it's yeah. very, very lifelike and realistic <laughs> uh, pattern changing. But uh, yeah, no, that was that was a fantastic uh, chat. Uh, you know, it's uh, for me, it was interesting to hear, you know, you, you mentioned it throughout the show that, you know, you know, the late 2000s, early 2010s, you know, Ashley Galante was kind of the name in youth bowling, yeah. uh, won two collegiate titles, a bunch of sport bowling awards along the way as well. And, and, you know, she talked about it, it was a little tough after that. And uh, I really appreciated her honesty and, you know, essentially kind of learning on the tour of the past five seasons. And it's one of those things where, especially being out there every week this past year, uh, you, you know, you saw things lining up the right way for her to f- find that continued success to make them to jump to the next level. And, uh, it, you know, she, she talked about the work, the dedication that, that she puts into it and, uh, would definitely not be surprised to see that success pay off in 2021. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I got, like I mentioned earlier in the interview, I got to, um, work with Ashley on extra frame. And so one of the things we would do is she would, she had her equipment there with us at the world series of bowling. And after they'd be done for the day, she'd practice. And I got to watch her practice. And the thing that she, she really liked, you know, asking me to tell her, Hey, throw a ball, you know, t- t- give me any trick you want to see me do and I'll do it. And I was always amazed at how talented she was at being able to do anything I asked her to do with a bowling ball. It was just amazing. She could, she could hook the whole lane and, and throw it slow. She could, you know, move all the way to the right and throw dead up two. And, and, and I was like, man, she's going to be, she's going to win. If they ever have a women's tour, she's definitely going to win. And I remember Lucas Wiseman and I having a conversation with our picks for like new players who are going to definitely win on tour. And he picked Elise Bolton and I picked Ashley Galante and it just hasn't happened. And so it's just really interesting, um, you know, to a, that we have a tour for, for these players to go out and try and, 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 you know, live their dreams, but it's interesting the ones that succeed and the ones that, you know, have, have, have to take more time before they can succeed and why that happens. And it's an interesting process. And, you know, to listen to Ashley talk about it, it feels like for her, it's just a confidence thing. You know, if, if Mm -hmm. once she gets, once she gets a little bit of success and, and it's amazing to me, it hasn't happened yet because you'd figure at some point she would have had something that she really, really liked and, and had a great week and that would just turn things around for her. But it, you know, it hasn't quite happened, but um, she, the, the thing that I would take away from this is that, you know, she understands that she's, you know, the longer she sticks to it, that's what's going to prove to be successful over time. And I really, really do believe that. And some people, it just takes more time than others. And I, I would not be surprised to see her, uh, you know, turn around her, her level of success on tour uh, very soon. I would agree, JT. Another great show in the books. Uh, coming up on Wednesday here on the PWBA podcast, we'll have uh, another player kind of looking for that breakout victory, Tanya Ramanper, uh, who was oh so close this past year at the U.S. Women's Open. Uh, I know you had a chance to talk to her on Splitting Boards a couple of weeks ago about that. Yeah. So that should definitely should be a, a fun and interesting show. Yeah. Uh, inside the OC on Thursday, uh, Matt Canzaro and I will be chatting with Hall of Famer Lenny Borsch Jr., Great guy. Uh, looking forward to that. And I know we got a few uh, additional shows on the docket here on Bowl TV. I'll let you yeah. uh, tell the folks. Yeah, we've got uh, you know PWBA replay tomorrow. Uh, we've got uh, Throwback Thursday match of the week on Thursday. But probably the highlight of all will be Wednesday's split and boards. We'll talk to Jacob Buttriff about his uh, 2019 USBC Masters victory. So I'm looking forward to uh, to that. That was a big. Uh, you know, talking about confidence, you mm-hmm. know, that, that was a big get the monkey off the back win for, for Jacob. He'd had some some pretty significant struggles on television. Um, and that one, you know, kind of kind of opened the floodgates for him and, and led to some, you know, obviously that that in itself was a big accomplishment. But, you know, some of the, the wins that he had after that um, 
as well, and just the confidence that uh, winning on television has kind of fostered in this game. And some added bonus excitement for that show. The good folks from Bayside Bowl were there. So that should be fun to uh, relive some of those moments as well. Uh, But that's going to do it for today for us, folks. So once again, we appreciate you watching us here on Bowl TV. Uh, As we said, we kind of laid out the schedule there for for the rest of the week. So be sure to check that out. Uh, So for Ashley Galante and Jason Thomas, I'm Aaron Smith. This is uh, the PWBA podcast on Bowl TV. Thanks again for joining us. And remember, Bull TV, bowling lives here. Have a great day, folks.